You're listening to the podcast of The Branch in Ashland, Virginia. At Christmas time, we wait with expectation. Depending on our age, we may be celebrating differently. Little children await ripping into those presents under the tree. Adults wait with expectation to see the reaction of those same little children when they see what's inside those presents. What have we been waiting for with expectation? There are a lot of things to anticipate when it comes to events uh, in life. Think about so many things that I've anticipated and and waited for. When I was younger, first dates, getting to drive, graduating, going off to college, getting a job, uh, think about my own wedding and what I, the waiting and expectation for that, the birth of all my kids, um, vacations as well. And, and it seems like there's this connection between uh, the anticipation and excitement that builds and the length of time that you have to wait for something. You know, you, for me, I, I, I like to know something far enough advan- in an advance that, that I can prepare myself, but not so far in advance that, like, it's starting to kill me and the people around because I'm so excited and, and waiting for it. You know, there are things in history, too, that people have waited for and, and wondered, when's this going to happen? Think about every time there's been a war in history that people are waiting with expectation and anticipation for their loved ones to return home again so that they can see them. Think about exciting historical things like putting a man on the moon, right? And the anticipation and excitement of that. And the fact that there were people that, who were actually able to see that happen when it actually happened. Think about political things that happened, like the fall of the Berlin Wall, that there was a city that was divided in Germany, and one day uh, that wall came down that divided the two cities and brought them together. You know, there's lots of things that have happened over time in history, but I don't think there's anything that uh, was as long in coming as the birth of Jesus. You know, the Old Testament is full of prophecies that had come from the, the prophets of, the, of Israel and Judah. And from the last prophecy that came out until Jesus finally came, there was 400 years. I mean, I don't know, some of us have a hard time waiting four minutes, let alone, you know, four weeks or four months. All of our kids, right, we've been waiting for Christmas to come, and tomorrow it's finally here. But think about, yeah, exactly. Think about what it was like to have to wait 400 years. You get to that point in the waiting that you wonder, is it even going to happen? You know, maybe some of the kids are feeling like, am I ever going to get to open these presents? That expectation. Christmas is all about anticipation. The excitement that builds in us. If we're parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles, we we hopefully love to, to see the faces of the kids and others that we give gifts to. There's that anticipation and excitement that's there. But have you ever had something that you've waited for for so long and and you started doubting whether it was worth it or not? You know, one of my favorite movies is A Christmas Story to watch this time of year. And I think if you've ever seen the movie, you know that little Ralphie in the, the show, you know, this was back in the days before the internet and before streaming. So they listened to the radio back then. And he was listening to Little Orphan Annie. And, and he had sent away for, for this little decoder. And he was so excited. He'd check his mailbox every day. And finally, that day came when it was there. He ripped it open. He listened to the radio show. And then he went up to decode it. And what did he find out? It was just a dumb commercial. (laughs) All that waiting, all that excitement. If you've you've, uh, been a fan of the show Ted Lasso, you know the the fictitious uh, um, football club in that. AFC Richmond, that the people have waited for a championship 
And they get to the point where they're like, you know what? We're just not even going to hope anymore because their phrase is, it's the hope that kills you. You think about what happens when we stake our hopes and anticipation and excitement on something that we've been told is coming. And that's what happened for the people of God. They've been waiting and waiting and waiting for God to finally send this promised one, this one who would fulfill all the promises that they had heard about. All the promises. And many people had gone before who had waited for those promises, who had anticipated them and had hoped that they would finally come. Here at the branch over the last few weeks, we've looked at some of those people who had waited with expectation. And they were witnesses to what God had done, even though they hadn't seen Jesus. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we see those people and we read about their testimony, their witness to faith. You would think that after all that waiting, 400 years of waiting, that when finally the promised one came that like there would be a lot of fanfare. You know, there wasn't paparazzi back in those days, but you know, that there would be somebody there who would witness it. Somebody who was, had a great reputation. And instead, God took people who were insignificant in the world, but significant in his eyes to witness the birth of the promised one of Jesus Christ. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. I'm reading from the New International Version. If you have a Bible with you, it's up on the screen as well. Um, If you have an app, just know that if you're not reading from the New International Version, it may be a little different than what's on the screen. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. If you know anything about shepherds, Uh, They were not uh, the upper crust of society. It says in this text that they were living in the fields. It wasn't that this was like their home away from home. This was where they lived. They were kind of like the homeless people. This was their job, and they focused all their attention on the sheep. If you're spending a lot of time around sheep, well, you probably smell like sheep for one. You probably also, if you don't have anyone to talk to, maybe you're talking to sheep. But but your social skills are probably not going to be the greatest either, right? Like any of us who spend a lot of time alone, like, you know, we might not be welcomed out in public very often. But think about these shepherds. And out of all the people that God could have had come and witness the birth of His Son, this promised one, the least likely of all those people was the shepherds. These people who were marginalized, living on the edge of society. And yet they were the ones to witness this thing that had been 400 plus years in the coming. Funny thing is, this wasn't something that just happened with the birth of Jesus. This was God's MO. He would do this often. 
He would find people who seemed insignificant. And he would say, I want to show you something. I want you to be a witness for me. And these people who seemed like they were small and insignificant all of a sudden were witness to something significant that God was doing. In Deuteronomy 7, 7, we read, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people's. For you were the fewest of all people. And God specifically chose his people because they were insignificant. They were small. They were the fewest of all people. They weren't something that they couldn't brag about how big they were. In Micah 5.2, we read another verse, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And there again, God is saying, the small, the insignificant, I'm going to make significant because I choose to use those kinds of people to bear witness to who I am. Over and over and over again, we see that. We see that throughout Hebrews 11. And then in Hebrews 12, the author of this letter that's written to early Christians says this, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This word in Hebrews 12 that's translated in English, witnesses, it's the Greek word from which we get the word martyr. Do we all know what a martyr is? It's somebody who who gives up their life for something. They're so convinced of something that they will bear witness to it at the expense of their very life. And that's what this word witness means. These people were witness to what God had done. Even though he'd only shown them a small little glimpse of who he was. But just like the shepherds, We might feel like we're on the outskirts of society, like maybe we don't belong. Like maybe we're not the greatest witnesses. Like they're far more important or popular or eloquent or rich or whatever people out there. Maybe God chose the wrong person. Maybe he needs to look for somebody else to do this. Because why on earth would God want me to be a witness for him? They're far more qualified people than me, right? You know, the dictionary's definition of a witness is an individual who, being present, personally sees or perceives a thing, a beholder, a spectator, or an eyewitness. Just like the shepherds were called to bear witness to the birth of Jesus, so we're called to bear witness to what God is doing. We're called to bear witness to Jesus, You know, if you've ever gone to court or if you've ever watched any courtroom dramas, you know that that sometimes defense attorneys will, will find witnesses and they'll do whatever they can to belittle those witnesses, to knock them down, to make what they're saying insignificant. The thing is, God had already called insignificant people to bear witness to him. Could they really have been knocked down much further? And really, when you find insignificant people to bear witness, then it becomes more about the message than the person bringing it. And that's really what the gospel is anyway, right? It's about us bringing a message that's far superior to who we are, much greater than who we are. And when we bring that message to other people and we bear witness to that, it's not about us. It's about the message that we're bringing. You know, God has always used those who may not have the greatest reputation. And one of the things 
that might be asked of us is if we witness and testify to who Jesus is, is what does he or she have to gain? When we testify, when we bear witness to what God has done in our lives and through us, what do we have to gain? Again, that's the advantage of being kind of a a nothing sometimes, feeling insignificant, just like the shepherds, that God can use us to make that message that much more powerful and that much bigger. We might feel like it's hard for us to be a witness. If we've experienced the love of Jesus Christ and and we're called to bear witness to who He is and what He's done, we may feel like, you know, not only do I feel insignificant, but I don't feel like I can bear witness. It's difficult. And the writer of Hebrews tells us how to get through that. How do we do that? without growing weary? How do we do that without losing heart? We fix our eyes on Jesus. I think back to that night 2,000 years ago where these dirty, smelly shepherds came walking in and there they found the promised one and they probably thought they went to the wrong place. But you know, there's something about a newborn baby, right? If you've ever witnessed it, you know that you just can't take your eyes off of them. No matter whether it's your child or not, you're just drawn to that baby. Your eyes fix on it. And I wonder if these rough and tumbling nomads who'd been living in the fields, if they came walking in and they saw this baby and they were struck and they stared and they fixed their eyes. And I wonder if the image that was burned in their heads continued to play back for them once they walked away, once they went back out to the fields, once they went back about doing all the work that they had. Did that image of Jesus come back to them again? You know, that's what we're called to do is fix our eyes on him. I'm not going all Will Ferrell here and saying the little baby Jesus is what we have to focus on. But we need to focus on Jesus. Yes, he grew up to become a man and that man gave himself as a sacrifice for us. And it's fixing our eyes on him, the newborn king who grew up, the king of the universe, the one who when we fix our eyes on him, We won't grow weary. We won't lose heart. And that's what we're called to today. Things may have been hard for us. All of us have come from different places, but the whole world's experienced COVID. The whole world has, has had to quarantine for a little bit and then test and then wonder, is the vaccine enough? Is is quarantining enough? What do I do? Do I go and meet with other people? We're all in the midst of difficult places. Some of us more so than others. And I wonder, are we going to testify in those difficult places? Are we going to bear witness in those difficult places? I'm struck in Luke 2 by what the text says in verse 19. When the shepherds go out and they testify, they bear witness, it says that the people were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. It doesn't say they ran away because these stinky shepherds came in. It doesn't say that that they ran away and and turned their nose at them because they they were the dregs of society, the marginalized. It said that the message that they heard from these shepherds amazed them. You see, it's not about what we have to give all the time. It's about the message that we're bringing. We might feel insignificant. We might feel small. But God delights in using the small to bring this incredible message to the world. And we can bear witness to that and bear witness to him. And so the question is, have we met this shepherd You know, Jesus, eventually in his earthly ministry, he associated himself with these shepherds. 
when he said in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. And Jesus introduces himself as a different kind of shepherd. And I wonder, have we met the promised one? Have we met the shepherd? And if we have, have we borne witness to the people around us? It doesn't have to come with eloquent words or fanfare. We can be like the shepherds and bear a message that will amaze the people around us. Has God made a difference in you? If he has, then he's calling you to bear witness to that in a simple and easy way. And if you haven't met him, if you haven't seen him, look around and find him anew in that manger tonight. Let me pray for us. God, thank you. Thanks for this time together. Thanks for coming and putting on flesh and living among us and giving yourself up for us. God, we are grateful to have received the greatest gift we could ever receive. And so, Father, if we have received that gift, then may we bear witness. May we tell others about it. And God, if we still haven't met you, then Father, show yourself to us. And may our eyes be fixed on you, whether we're seeing you for the first time or seeing you for the hundredth time. God, remind us of this precious gift that we receive in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How are we bearing witness to what we've seen God do? At Christmas time, as we consider the gift that God gave us through his son Jesus, have we met him and have we been changed? And then, how have we testified to what he's done in us? We hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any comments or questions, please email us at thebranchashland at gmail.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, give us a review, and share with your friends wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.